We're finishing up a series from 1 Corinthians. We're calling Kelly on the Cross. We're going to explain a little bit why this morning as we finish up what it says in 1 Corinthians 1, 17 and 18. This is a verse that we've been springboarding off of. 1 Corinthians 1, 17 through 18. It's in your worship folder. There's a sheet there. Let me read that. Paul writes, Christ did not send me to baptize but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. What we've been noticing is that the cross can be emptied of its power. The cross can be rendered of no effect. It can be rendered impotent. And Paul suggests that the message of the cross is the power of God. So the impact and the power of the cross is directly related to the accuracy of the message. Distorting the message empties the cross of power. Accurately reflecting the message preserves the power of the cross. Paul writes, adding human wisdom to this message distorts the gospel and empties the cross of power. What is the gospel? called several things. It's called the message of the cross here. It also elsewhere is called the message of reconciliation. Looked at a definition of that from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you're looking for a sentence that captures what happened at the cross, if you want to accurately both understand and reflect that, I'm not sure that there's any better explanation than the one scripture provides. What was the cross about? What was happening on the cross? And here gives a precise, clear, terse answer. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. What's happening at the cross? Why did Jesus come? Why did Jesus die? What does the resurrection signify? It signifies this. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. Paul chooses the word reconciliation because it clarifies the message. We've been saying that reconciliation was never used in a religious context. The word means to substitute a relationship of hostility or distance to one of closeness and friendliness to create relationship. And the reason why it was never applied religiously is nobody ever figured that God would be interested in relationship. So it was never used in a religious context, until Paul took the word, dusted it off, and in giving a one-word definition of what this cross signifies, this is the word Paul inserted, reconciliation. A couple things we've been looking, God is the reconciler. When reconciliation occurs in this context, one person is initiating the contact. It's not heaven, it's not the earth to heaven, it's heaven to earth. God is the reconciler. He's the one who does the work. He makes reconciliation happen. And our job is to believe the message of reconciliation and to continue to believe it. The thing about reconciliation is that it is effective if it's believed. I can say, let's be friends. If we've had trouble in the past, I say, let's be friends. If you don't believe me, you're not going to accept the message of reconciliation. It's really not going to change our relationship. So God can say, I'm reconciling myself to you. But if we don't believe it, it doesn't do anything for us. But if we believe it, it does something for us. We've talked about the fact that we come to believe this in a number of different ways. Some of us, it's a one-point decision and a prayer. Others of us, it's not a point-in-time decision, but it's something that we come to. It doesn't, it's not as important how this faith comes to exist, but that it exists and that it continues to exist. You say, faith in what, Mike? The message of reconciliation. Here's what God wants you to believe. Do you believe this? this believing this makes you a Christian. Believe what? God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. It's a verse 
worth your while to remember and memorize. Do you memorize this? Look at it. Look at the words. You commit that to memory. If you do, you know what you've done? Commit it to memory, the, the message of reconciliation, the message of the cross, the gospel. The simple message is very inclusive. It's hard to find any superiority here. It's hard to find any innies and outies. When we add human wisdom to the gospel, that becomes the basis upon which we differentiate between us and them. There's no us versus them here, is there? All of us are sinners. A world full of sinners and God reconciles the world to himself at the cross. When we add things to the gospel, addition leads to division. When the message of the Bible becomes the basis of segregation, the cross is being killed. By burning the cross, the Ku Klux Klan unwittingly symbolizes the effect of its doctrine. Some people might believe within the Klan that the Bible supports their views. That is absolutely, unquestionably wrong and false. The doctrines of the Ku Klux Klan, any doctrine that takes the Bible and uses it as a basis for dividing between us and them, they are in doing that, killing the cross. When we gauge church health, trying to figure out if church is healthy or not, when did, how would you try to figure that out? What indicators suggest church health? Maybe attendance figures? Spiritual disciplines of the individuals within the church? Programs? How many programs are there? Meaning how many different kinds of needs? How many conversions have there been? What about budget? You know what Paul looks at when he looks for the evidence of church health or not? He looks for the presence or absence of divisions. He sees divisions as evidence of a power outage, as the cross being emptied of power. This is hard for us to understand and truly get our arms around because we are at the end of several millennia of dividing. We talked about Paul at his time was concerned that the church in Corinth was dividing into thirds. It was very concerning to him. Do you remember the figure that I cited indicated how many Christian denominations there are in the world now? 41,000. So it makes us almost 14,000 times worse off than he was. Um, where did divisions come from? Paul suggests a couple answers in his letter, and they both have to do with leadership. Divisions can come from lifting leaders up, and divisions can come from tearing leaders down. Um, divisions can be associated with lifting leaders up. This is what we find in the church at Corinth. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians 3. Paul writes, you are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? What after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers and you are God's field, God's building. What's happening in Corinth is that there's bragging rights dependent on who that they align themselves with and perhaps who baptized them. Some are claiming Paul. Others are claiming Apollos. Others are claiming Peter. And there's a pecking order being established. If I get baptized by Paul, that makes me chicken number one. You were baptized by who? Peter? That makes you maybe chicken number two or chicken number three. And so what's happening in the church in Corinth, there's a pecking order going on, depending on how they perceive their pedigree, depending on who they come from. Um, what Paul says is this is worldly. Worldly. When we think of worldly, we think of secular. 
What's worldly? Money is worldly. Banks are worldly. Sexuality is worldly. And these things can be, but in Paul's understanding here, worldliness is about being proud. Worldliness ascends into greatness. Worldliness is when we want to see ourselves as better than them, holier than them, more included by them. We are above them. We are a step above them. That is worldly. Um, biblically, uh, godliness descends into greatness. It descends into greatness. And again, the cardinal expression of that is God become human, Jesus Christ, God and man. The night before he dies, when the disciples are fighting about who's going to be remembered as the greatest, Jesus performs the lowliest act of service, does something no self-respecting person would do, puts himself in the form of a servant, stoops. At that time, the streets would have been very dusty, perhaps even rainy, mud caked on their feet, and so they recline at table. Okay, put this together. Seats, they're not putting their feet underneath their chairs. There's no chairs. They're reclining at table. So we're reclining at table, and we've been walking through the streets of Jerusalem. Maybe it's been raining. So I have my foot out there, and then there's Peter's foot out there, and it's probably not very far from Matthew, and it's dirty. So nobody, I'm not going to wash feet. Kid me? That would be lowly. I'm not going to take the form of a servant. People wouldn't respect me. They wouldn't see me as important as I am. And so what Jesus does, he takes off his tunic and then he wipes people's feet, cleans off the mud. Says, as you've seen me do to you, do to others. Godliness descends into greatness. Worldliness ascends into greatness. Pride is very comfortably cloaked in Christian garb. We can wrap up selfishness, pride, in Christian clothes, differentiate between us and them, and call it godliness. But godliness, again, doesn't ascend, it descends. Um, it's possible to wrap selfishness in Christian garb, and it becomes serve us rather than service. The, directive, the direction of human wisdom is up. Uh, you can do that by raising leaders up. That's what happened in Corinth. Another way to go up, I don't have to raise leaders up, or another way Paul cites is by tearing leaders down. Uh, look what it says in Titus 3. Paul writes, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, to show true Humility toward all men. Goes on to say, avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once and then warn him a second time. After that, have nothing to do with him. You may be sure that such a man is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. It says, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities. Um, I think he's talking not about civil authorities, but church authorities in the context. In the first chapter, verse 5, he writes to Titus, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. And as God gave instructions to Paul on how to develop the church, he felt clear that important thing for him to do was establish a body of leaders in each city into which he went so that they would be a body of individuals to govern the church when he went elsewhere. And apparently this is God's choice to use human leaders to, in some case, organize and guide divine affairs. Paul urges his readers to defer to the decisions of leaders. 
that are over them. And not doing so, in Paul's opinion, creates problems. When it says be obedient, it literally be persuaded by their leaders. That's the word. It's not just obedient generally. It's obedient to leadership. That's what the word is. It says to slander no one. Today, slander means to make false and damaging statements against someone. When you think of slander, you think of saying something that's not true. In Paul's day, slander was not just saying something untrue. It could be saying something that is true. But the reason you're saying it is to tear somebody down. And that's what Paul's concern is here. It's not just targeting false statements. It includes true statements that impugn the character of an individual. And that's what Paul's saying. Don't do that. Don't do that. Defer to leadership. Don't slander them. Don't tear them down. Uh, and Paul, he's especially concerned about self-serving leaders who are doing that. When it says, warn a divisive person once, the word for the divisive person is the word from which we get the word heretic. It's a heretic. When we think of heretics, we think of someone who's saying something untrue. Not in that day. That's not what a heretic was. A heretic could say something true. Heretic literally means a sectarian, divisive person. So a heretic could be someone who takes a minor truth, a minor truth, magnifies it out of all proportion in order to create a division so that he can draw away part of the split-off group to himself. That's a heretic. Somebody who creates a division to be able to insert him or herself as a leader to draw away adherents after him or herself. That's what Paul is especially concerned about. This is really what worries him. People use minor, marginally important things and make a big deal of them in order to, again, split and divide and conquer. Um, what it says in writing to the elders that he put in place in Ephesus, in Acts 20, it's in your worship folder. Here's what Paul writes. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. And he goes into the responsibilities of individuals put in place as elders or shepherds, whatever you call them. Here we call them elders. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise, distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be in your guard. That's what he says. Remember that for three days, for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Um, Paul's speaking again to the elders in Ephesus, and he, warn, he warns them about wolves in sheep's clothing. Wolves in sheep's clothing. A couple things to remember about wolves in sheep's clothing. Who is it that wears sheep's clothing? Sheep don't wear sheep's clothing. They don't wear clothing. Who wears sheep's clothing? Shepherds. They wear sheep's clothing. They wear wool garments. So what he's when Jesus talked about wolves in sheep's clothing, he's not talking about wolves dressed up like sheep. He's talking about wolves dressed up like shepherds. Another thing to remember, um, that wolves don't hate sheep. You know, they don't, they don't sit around at night talking about, geez, I hate sheep. Geez, I hate sheep. They just need to eat them. That means nothing personal. Just business. Just business. Wolves just need to eat sheep. Um, Paul's greatest concern was pseudo-Christian leaders who preyed on sheep rather than praying for sheep. A lot of times they come from those who lob grenades at leadership in order to, they appear as leaders, but their goal again is to divide and conquer. Um, Paul puts leaders in place to protect the message that's why Paul deals not only with building inspection, but with builder inspection. But it says in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10, 
verses 10 through 17. Paul writes, By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If a man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved but only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple. In this context, uh, you are. if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. I talked about this before. It's not talking about smoking or overeating. The temple being described here is not individual is corporate and what I think is happening here this verse is used to frighten believers it's to say that at some point after the resurrection you're going to appear and then your work's going to be analyzed what did you do what didn't you do the image here I don't think this is about judging sheep in general I don't think that's what this is it's judging shepherds in particular it's judging shepherds in particular. Um, what would you work like? James says, let not many of you be teachers, knowing the teachers will incur a stricter condemnation. Somebody standing up in front, claiming a platform from which to speak biblically about things, I don't understand what the accountability will look like, but there is an accountability, and I think that's what's being described here. Um, watch out what you say. If you're saying, thus says the Lord, you better do the best you can to make sure that what you're saying is really from him. A number of individuals would lead from television or whatever and say, God told me that 3,000 of you need to give so much money That is really dangerous. Claiming to speak on behalf of God is a very grave thing. And again, there's no I don't know what the consequences look like, but anyways, that's what is being described here. And again, this is used to frighten Christians, but this verse, however, is warning shepherds, not sheep. Paul describes himself as the builder. He put the foundation in place. And now other people are building on that foundation. And there's Apollos is building on it, and Peter is building on it, and then that they're okay. There are some other people building on it from the outside. And what Paul says, be careful about how you build on this foundation. If you use gold, silver, and precious stones, if you use things that go with the foundation, things that are associated with what, Mike? The message of reconciliation. You're clear about that, you're teaching about that. Build on that. There's a lot of things you can add to that foundation, but the basis of what happens on the cross needs to be clear. Um, then that's good. That's the way to build. But if you use wood, hay, and straw, building something, but not doing so with the truth or in the manner that, that God has chosen, that's a problem. It, and it doesn't only describe what you say, but how you're supposed to say it. Christian ministry requires both, the truth and the spirit with which you say it. Well, what was Jesus' spirit? What did he say? Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. The only self-description description Jesus gives of himself. For I am gentle and humble in heart, You'll find rest for your soul. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Say the right thing in the right manner. Say the truth gently. That's the way to build with gold, silver, and precious stones. Uh, two different outcomes when dealing with careless builders. 
One is a benign problems. Look what it says in verse 14. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it's burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flame. I think this is describing somebody like Apollos. Apollos was a good guy. When Paul caught up with some of his converts in Ephesus, he said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. Uh, Apollos might have dropped the ball there. But it wasn't malicious. He wasn't trained. And so what Paul did, he, he had him speak to Priscilla and Aquila, and they taught him right. So, And this is one of those cases where for a while Apollos might have built on the foundation, left some things out, didn't mean it. You know, so part of his work might not have been the quality that it would have been if he had a bigger arsenal of correct truth. But he's going to be okay. Because, again, it's not malicious. There is, however, maliciousness around. Self-serving leaders who aren't as interested in the truth as wrapping themselves with the truth to divide congregations and that one, Paul has a little bit of a stronger statement. He says at the end of that, if anyone destroys God's temple, and again, this isn't talking about smoking. This is talking about dividing a congregation. If anyone does that maliciously, what it says, God will destroy him. God's temple is sacred. And you are that temple. God cares about his church. Again, we're in a place where, how can you tell? How can you tell the difference between good building tools, good builders, bad building tools, bad builders? You do have the answer to that, you know. You do have the answer. Do you remember it? You say, remember what, Mike? The gospel? What's that? The message of the cross? What's that? The message of reconciliation. The basis. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. There's a spirit when this is the basis of ministry. I want you to picture a kid, a little kid. He's coming in from the outside. He's been playing with friends. Somebody said something to him mean, but he's crying. Okay? Comes to you, you're his parent. A couple different ways you can handle the, him. Uh, say, you say, what happened? And he describes it. Well, I was playing and they did that to me. And then you might say, well, you're going to have to get used to that. Is that a correct response? Is he going to have to get used to that? Perhaps, yeah, that happens in this world. Correction's necessary. How would you feel if that was you? You come. Feel beat up. And are told, you have to get used to that. That's the way things work. Try, let's play it back. Let me be your father. You're the wounded child. Somebody at work said something to you, and it disturbs you. You feel beat up. You feel hurt. You feel sad. You come to me. Let me be your dad. I could say, you have to get used to that. You know what else I could do? I could say, come here. That hurts when that happens, doesn't it? You know, I'm going to have to get used to that. Hmm. I'm going to end up saying the same thing, am I? Did that feel the same to you? Did that feel the same? You know the difference between the first and the second? The second did connection, then correction. Connection, then correction. That is a way to describe this. Is God interested in your behavior? Is he interested in your behavior? Yes. What does he offer you first? Correction, get it right, 
then connection, correction, then connection. Brian, can I steal you for a second? Come on up here. Brian's got some issues. <laughs> Tell you what, Brian. I think there's some possibilities for you, but you know what? I see some things here, so you deal with that, and then we'll we'll be able to we'll be connected. You deal with that, and you know that stands in the way, Brian. That's a that's a sin issue, and you know I can't have anything to do with sin. So you're going to have to get rid of that and deal with that. And if you do, I'm sure that one will be able to connect. Is that this? That is correction, then connection. That's not the gospel, is it? This is the gospel. Brian still has issues. You know what, Brian? I, I, I know. I see. I understand. But I'll tell you what. Let's form a relationship in which you experience conscious contact with me. Let's, let's, make, let's form a relationship in honesty. So within the context of this relationship, how about let's deal with some of those things? Is this the gospel? This is the gospel. That's, it's connection, then correction. It's not only the right thing said in the right context. Uh, that's the message of reconciliation. It's the message of the cross. It's the power of God. Joel, come on up, and then we're going to sing a closing song. Father, thank you for the message, the cross, what it signifies. You reconciling the world to yourself and Christ, not counting men's sins against them. You entrust to us the message of reconciliation. We implore people on your behalf, be reconciled to God. We implore people, urge them plead with them. We don't bully them. We don't berate them. We implore. We, we indicate that you have crossed the heavens to connect with them. You would reconcile with them. And in experiencing that reconciliation, they can reconcile with themselves and with one another. That's the way your work happens. Our love for others is an echo of, of your love for us. We hear that. We echo it out. Pray that you would help us to understand, believe, remember, make room for, believe in the message of reconciliation so we could be reconciled to you and continually and progressively, not perfectly, reconciled with others. In Jesus' name, amen.